Okay, welcome to Spine Conference. Today's discussion is going to be on pedicle subtraction, osteotomy, uh, non-unions. And Dr. Dr. Brick is an expert on this because he's had some experience, so we're going to ask him a lot of questions today. Okay. <laughs> so this is this is a this is a real case. Um, she is a 66-year-old woman who presented with uh, low back pain, mostly right low back pain. And her pain started in June, and I just recently saw her in November or so. Uh, and she was 15 months post-op from this massive surgery. You see the x-rays here. Her, yeah, it's, a, it's an incredible surgery. Yeah, we're going to get into that. She had an L2. Her story is she had an L2 S1 posterior fusion by Dr. McDonald. And I think that's the same Dr. McDonald who was at the uh, Colts doctor. Do you remember him, Dr. Brick? He's a good guy, actually. I do not. He's a very good guy, and uh, he was one of my. T at the end of his career, he was uh, he wasn't operating, but he was still teaching at Hopkins, and he was one of my teachers, and he was really good. He was a really good surgeon. He did her surgery when she was uh, in 1962 at the age of 12, and she she had just a fusion from L2 to S1 posteriorly, non instrumented, and um, she developed a flat back deformity, which I'm going to go over, and then on March 2016. She um, she uh, had a um, T T nine the S one fusion with a L three pedicle subtraction osteotomy. The surgery um, uh, was very difficult to recover from. She was in rehab for two months, and she has. Um, Many arthritic abnormalities. Both shoulders are replaced. Left total hip was replaced twice. Right total knee. She's a uh, short woman, four feet eleven inches, one seventy-five pounds. So this is um, on the left. Uh, you, she's this is her CAT scan from two thousand thirteen. So this is uh, five years ago, before before that big surgery. And this is this is what she was almost her entire life, and you can see. On the back side, she solidly fused. Aaron showed posteriorly. She, she solidly fused on the back. And interestingly, the front has fused too. You see how the, everything is fused. Now, um, L5S1, she has a high-grade spondylolisthesis with rounding of the sacrum. See how the, the top, Aaron, can you show them the four or five is? It's like this. Here, let me show you. That's four. This is. You see it? This. It's hard to, um, that's five right there, see it? So five, five is, it's fused to the sacrum. The sacrum's like got a slope to it. And on the right, that's, on the right, that's not her, but that shows you how the sacrum can become sloped with these deformities in children. And the L5 bone is in the pelvis. I mean, it's quite, it's quite an incredible deformity, isn't it? And, and it's, it's, uh, for people who don't, aren't spine experts, it's unfathomable that this could occur, but it can. And it's a serious problem at the base of the spine. So it's basically like the, the bottom of a column is deformed. So what happens in remarkable, these kids walk around, but after a while, their L5 nerve root gets irritated because of the deformity in the S1 nerve roots, and they can lose their bowel and bladder control because of, um, uh, you can imagine the bowel and bladder control is, S2 to S4, which is at the top of the sacrum. Here, I'm showing the top of the sacrum. You see at the very top there how the spinal canal is really tethered? So that's what happens to these children is they lose their bowel and bladder control, and it's usually girls. Um, it's a serious problem. And then on the bottom is a cartoon which just shows the different grades of spondylolisthesis. So she was, she, she, this woman by definition when she was 12 years old was not spondylolisthesis, but uh, it was a high grade deformity. So it, it, she's interesting from the beginning, and she was fused perfectly by Dr. McDonald, but the problem is she became arthritic above her fusion. You can see the uh, vacuum signs and the discs, and she's pitched forward. Now, she has been pitched forward for 50 years, but maybe, she, I don't know, she couldn't deal with it anymore. So I just wanted to show you what happens to the sacrum with spondylolisthesis. This is uh, this is um, an article. This is the only article I ever published, actually. And um, 
I don't know if I should be proud of that or embarrassed of that, but it's the only one I ever published when I was a fellow. And I went over 45 cases of spondylolisthesis, and you can see that all the sacrums, what they look like. Like the first one, number one, that's a high grade, and the sacrum sloped. You see that? And two, you see how it's a high grade and the sacrum sloped and curved? But the other ones, you see the sacrum's not sloped, not curved. It's straight. It's, it's, a, it's a lot of, there's a lot of variability. Um, I, I don't know. I found it kind of fascinating. I, I think it's a confluence of a bunch of things when it happened to the child. Because if you have a deformity in a child, while the child is growing, the, bo the bones deform tremendously. And they can be very unusual uh, deformities. But if the child is done growth, and girls stop growing around ballpark around 14, 15, they're done growth usually. And boys, though, can grow up to 21. But once a child is done growth, I don't think they develop these deformities. So it, it's got a lot to do with when it happens in, in childhood. And if you develop the spondylolisthesis in adulthood, you don't get these rounded sacrums. You don't get these uh, unusual deformities. It just slides, but the bones look kind of normal. These are all the parameters that I measured during the article. We won't get into that. But So we're back to our patient. So she, she had an MRI. And the MRI uh, showed no stenosis, no infection, no abscess. But L3 is basically gone because they had a PSO. See L3? There's no square there, right? And we're going to get into that. But there's no, no infection. And the spinal canal, you see the circle of the spinal canal is wide open. That was the laminectomy. So here's the, um, here's the, this is after on the left that her surgery and before on the right. And you can see... L3 has been cut, and you can see the back posteriorly, the bones has been removed too. See that big hole? Oh, yeah. He had to get to the front of the spine by removing a big bone. The nerves are in the middle, and then there's a cut in the front of the spine. So what's, what's uh, you know, very obvious in this case is there's no bone. Be the, the, the top part of the bone and the bottom part of the bone are disconnected. So it never fused. And you have a vacuum sign at the disc space at L2, L3. And, of, and just from um, uh, experience, Aaron, when we cut into a vacuum sign disc, what's there? Air. It's air, right? It's a hole. So what's going on in her is she never healed, and it's not connected. The top of her spine is not connected to the bottom of her spine because she never healed. So this is, is – this. I mean, vacuum sign happens in normal people. When you get a very arthritic disc, you see here the disc, it's dark, it's black because that's just air. It's, it's like a vacuum. And when you cut it open in surgery, there's nothing there. It's gone. So, so just when you uh, – she had a CAT scan, so I evaluated, all the, evaluated every image. This is T9, the very top screw. There, he put some men in there. The surgeon put some men in there to make the bone stronger. And it, this screw was, went in, out, in technique. You can see how the screw – Aaron showed the screw is outside of the verbal body. And – the reason is, this is a standard technique on the, on the far right is that in, out, in. You want to put a screw down the center of the pedicle. Aaron showed them where the pedicle is. Down the center of the pedicle. But some people's pedicle... What are you doing? That's a facet. Sorry. Hold on. Give me that. Wait, did you drink coffee today? I'm working. This is the pedicle. So you want a screw that goes straight down the pedicle. But sometimes the pedicle is too small or it's deformed. So what you can do is in out in technique. You start lateral, a little bit lateral, then you're lateral to the pedicle, and then you go into the body. Wow. So that that's like something that you can do. The only problem with that is sometimes you can hit a nerve root that's outside, but I won't get in the thoracic spine. It's not a big deal. So, um, so this is that screw, and this is a T9 screw, and usually the ballpark measure where the end screws some people say is a 75 yard line of the vertebral body. So that arrow is at the 75 yard line. So the canal is the zero yard line. Aaron, show them the bottom of the canal. The other, the other one. Yeah. And then the, the other side of the body is 100 yards. So 75 is where you sort of should end it. And the reason is, there's a reason for that on the left is you can hit something. So that screw, can anybody guess what that screw may be up, right up against? Right. So... We have this pulsating structure, boom, 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 boom. That's right there. Now, this did not cause an aortic rupture or a tear or whatever, but it's really close. And uh, you may say, well, it's okay. What's the big deal? Maybe it's right up against it. It's not a big deal. Nothing's happened yet. 
But the aorta, as you know, if you looked at it with your eyes, what does it look like? If you cut somebody open and looked at it in aorta, what does it look like? How would you describe it? It's pulsating, right? It's bounding. So you can imagine over time, this this could this could tear the aorta. Unlikely, but in an optimal world, you don't want to have that screw that long. Uh, so the L2 screws were perfect. And then this is at the level of the osteotomy. There's no bone formation. There's like you can see in the on the backside, the, there's Aaron Shaw, there's no bone there. So it's a non-union. And basically where I circled, those two areas are not connected. Um, so she's, there's no bone present posteriorly. And these are this is the L4 screws. The base uh, has sacroiliac screws. And I was a little, I was concerned about these. I usually don't use these because I feel the sacroiliac joint, if you put a screw across the joint, it could be a source of pain. And um, the other issue that she has is the sacroiliac joints are opened, like they're, they're deformed. You see how that's opened? And the reason is her whole spine is fused, so the next joint after the spine is a sacroiliac joint. So it's, it's becoming ab abnormal. There's no good solution for that. Um, this just shows the L4 screws are in good position, but they may be loose. You see how there's a black line around them? That, that's, they, that may be what's called a halo loosening sign. Um, and then she has an S1 screw, which on the right may be slightly medial, but probably it's probably okay. But there's no S1 screw on the left. So this is the screw that I was concerned about because she had right side low back pain. This screw exited the ilium. So it's not a super big deal, but I thought maybe it's a source of pain for her. Um, again, this is the non-union. SI joints widen laterally. Non-union. So last thing is I want to show uh, the osteotomy. So I measured on the right, this is before osteotomy, I measured from L2 to L3, and I measured zero degrees. And, um, and then I measured from T11 to S2, and I measured five degrees. So normally the lumbar spine has anywhere between 35 and 50 degrees of lordosis. And on the left is the after, and between L2 and L3, I measured 20 degrees. So the, the surgeon was successful in getting 20 degrees backwards. So he got her straighter. But um, he didn't get anything else anywhere else. The rest of the spine was kind of like the same. So he did get 20 degrees of lordosis, which is pretty good. Um, any questions so far about this patient? Okay, I'm just going to keep going. So what? she's got a flat back deformity. This is Paul Harrington. Paul Harrington... Um, um, was a spinal surgeon, 1911, 1980. He was an amazing man. He was from Kansas. He was the national jav javelin champion. He served our country in the Pacific in World War II, and he was like a tremendous American. And he, uh, when he came back, he did scoliosis surgery for children with polio, and he used this and created this rod that basically distracted the spine. Um, and he sold the rod. Um, he was from Baylor, Texas. Uh, and there are a million cases done with this rod between 1960 and 1990. In fact, some people still say when they see any implant in the spine, they say it's a Harrington rod, just because that was the first one, right? But it's those people are going away. But it used to be everything was a Harrington rod. But what happened with Harrington rods is is it made a flat back. So uh, on the on the sagittal cut on the on the sagittal view, the spine was straight, which is not normal, and people were pitched forward. So what would happen in these scoliosis cases, their gravity line was pitched forward from optimal. And this is a very uncomfortable position. This is what we should look like. We should have 60 degrees of lordosis in the lumbar spine, around 40 degrees of kyphosis, thoracic spine, and some 15 degrees of lordosis in the cervical spine. There's a gentle contour in the side view. So if you're straight, it's a problem. So you can imagine, like, is this building good to be like that? You know, answer, obviously the answer is no. It's not good to have uh, uh, abnormal forces across a standing structure. So if people have this, the surgical treatment is you have to cut a wedge out of the spine if you, if you want to fix it. And this it's, it's called the pedicle subtraction osteotomy. And basically you remove the pedicle of the spine and you cut from the back all the way to the front. You cut a wedge and then you straighten the spine. And that gives people a straight uh, 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 contour on the side view. And I usually use osteotomes. These are these um, sharp instruments that cut through bone. It, it makes it easier. 
This is an article from 2014 that reviewed 423 patients in eight centers that had this surgery, pedicle subtraction osteotomy. And how did they do? 7% had the intra-op complication, 39%, so over a third had a post-op complications, and the complication rate was almost 50%. 2.6% cord deficit, which is a disaster. Uh, major blood loss, four liters, and 20, 24%. And the average blood loss was three liters. So how much blood, if we cut Chris open, his juggler open, and drain all the blood out of him, how much blood would we get if we collected it and measured it? Is there been, about five liters. So you can imagine, if you lose three liters, that's a problem. <laughs> and people start to become uh, coagulopathic. Uh, so the average blood loss was three liters. So this is a very, very big operation. It's a very serious operation with a lot of risks, perioperative risks. Uh, and this is, actually, I took this slide from the internet from Charles Sanser's lecture, so I apologize. Uh, yeah, wedge, yeah, pedicle starts to osteotomy. So basically, you, you, you posteriorly decompress, then you remove the pedicles, you expose the front of the spine. I usually put four by fours to protect everything in the front. And then you cut a wedge in the front, and then you uh, put instruments, and then you uh, uh, put a pressure on it, usually through the instrumentation. You can do it through the table, too. And then you give the person a straight contour. And there's different types of, of pedicle subtraction osteotomies. And the standard one is number three, um, which retains the disc. Personally, I, it's not like I know everything. I prefer four because you remove the disc, you get some more uh, degrees, but also you get a bigger fusion area. So this is this is what I'm talking about. If you If you cut through the disc when you're done. So I, I, I did this last night on my dining room table to show you guys, and I cut it with a piece of paper, and then I brought it backwards. Whenever I do a PSO, I mean, I haven't done that many. I mean, probably like six in my career. I always plan it out and look what it's going to look like. If you do it through the disc space, you get a fusion anteriorly. You see that? Like there's no, it's easy to get the front of the spine to fuse. So in my mind, why not always do it like that? Why not always have the front of the spine fuse? Um... Anyway, that's my two cents. So in this patient, you know, I, 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 she was standing in front of me. She goes, what do I do, doc? I said, you know what? Let me just take out that one screw on the right and see if it helps you because it looks like it could be painful before we go and do a massive surgery. So long story short, I took it out. did not help at all. And this is just afterwards. And then uh, like a month afterwards, taking that one screw out, the left side broke. So... Uh, basically, she that proved that now she has a non-union. The implants, you know, starting to break fatigue, and she wanted uh, she wanted surgery, so she couldn't deal with it anymore. So I told her this is you know if you, I, I I discussed with her like quite frankly that it's probably better to live with this problem because it's a massive surgery with serious risks. She said she can't live with it anymore. She couldn't take it anymore. She was willing to take any risk involved. And uh, I also asked her to go to her uh, old surgeon, and he wouldn't do the surgery. Um, this was before the rod broke, and she was upset, and anyway, it was complicated socially. So I decided I'll do it. So the plan was, the basic premise was there's a non-union there. So I felt the easiest, safest, fastest way to fix this problem was to remove the caps, remove the rods, remove the left T10 screw because it may be a little long, hitting the aorta. Uh, I decided to take out the iliac screws because it was crossing the sacral iliac joint. I feel that may be a source of pain and put in a new sacral screw on the right. On the left, she has a good screw. So then she, if below the non-union, non-union is at L3, L4. She'll have four good screws, L4 and S1. On the top, she's got plenty of screws. Take some iliac crest bone graft because the that's the best thing to get it to fuse. And then use BMP to get it to fuse because BMP is a very powerful way to get things to fuse. So these are my intraoperative notes. The surgery took two hour, 40 minutes, which is very good for the complexity of the surgery. I lost 1.2 liters of blood, which is more than I would like, but I feel it's not terrible. Um, and this is her post-op post day two standing. And um, she did <coughs> she did very well, I think, so far. Uh, so this is a CASCAM post-op, and Aaron, circle the um, circle where the BMP is. So we connected. See, do you see it? Let me show you. 
I mean, you were, you were, like, you get, you're getting a D so far. Okay? <laughs> this is the BMP here, and this is the bone. So I, I put BMP. So does everyone know what BMP or bone morphogenic protein is? It's a hormone. It's very, very powerful. It's made by Medtronic. They only have the only one on the market. It's very expensive, uh, and they use it with master graft strip, which is calcium hydroxyapatite. And this is this is yeah, yeah it's a scaffolding exactly. So this is what it looks like with your eyeballs. So this is actually one that I put in. And I took a picture of it with my iPhone to show everybody. The collagen sponge has the BMP or the hormone, and the middle part is the uh, calcium hydroxyapatite or master graft. And I make it look like that. Everyone does it different. Some people wrap it. Sometimes I wrap it. I make it like that because I like ice cream sandwiches. When I was growing up, they were 25 cents at the at the local highs. That was the only one I could afford. So it was like a quarter. So I've always had a weakness for ice cream sandwiches. So I make it look like an ice cream sandwich. Aaron likes ice cream sandwiches too. So <laughs> between the two of us, we always make it look like an ice cream sandwich. <laughs> so this is... <laughs> <laughs> so this is uh, the BMP, uh, and it's you can see. Remember when there was no bone? Now it's it's bridging, and now it's, this is the bottom part with new L4 screws. And these are the S1 screws. They're they're in good position. I wanted to make sure they look good because it's hard in this deformity. And this the sacred leg joints are out. Screws are out now. And here, can you? This is where we took. Uh, this is the alien. This is where we took the bone graft and. There's not a hole there because what I do is after I take bone graft, I fill it back up with allograft, and that all heals up. So that's where I took the bone. So this is sort of the final result. It shows you how I connected the bone with BMP. Yeah. So, yeah, it looks it looks good. So whether whether it will heal or not, only the good Lord in heaven knows. But... Uh, both me and Aaron are really praying that it's going to work for this lady. And the other option I had was to go in the front and put bone graft in the front of the spine. But then I would have to dissect the fecal sac, the nerve roots. It would have increased, it, it, for me, it would have increased the operative time for at least an hour or two, probably two or three hours. And I just felt it wasn't worth the risks. So this is a, a non union of pedicle subtraction osteotomy. And I, I try to, I, I feel very strongly that when I do the PSOs, I do it through the disc space so I get the front of fuse. I think it's really important. So any questions so far? It was probably bone, it was probably bone at the end of the surgery, okay. but it didn't heal and just resorbed and now it's gone. Because oh. I'm sure the surgeon put bone there. The surgeon's a good surgeon. Like how you take I'm not sure how he took it. I'm not sure where he took it from. He may have just used allograft, the local bone. He probably just used local bone. I just wasn't sure that that long ago, like what they were doing. No, no, there's two surgeries. So there's one in 1962, but the last one was 2016. Oh, oh, okay. So this this is repair from the one in 2016. Right. I right. I just did surgery. I did the surgery last week. Okay. I won't say the name. Don't say the name. Yeah. Don't say the name. Yeah. So. um that's what happened. So she had a non-union from the 2016 okay. surgery. So I'm going to show you two more cases of pedicle subtraction osteotomy just, just to go over what it's like. So this is another woman. She's a 64-year-old woman with low back pain, left grade than right hip pain. She was fused non-instrumented in 1993 from L4-S1 posteriorly. Then she, she had an anterior fusion at L304 by another surgeon. I don't know why. And this is what she looks like. And she, you see her gravity line. The C7, it should go through her sacrum, is way out front. And T12 is way out front. So she's really pitched forward. Mm -hmm. And her hips are flexed. And this is just her x-ray. It's hard to interpret the x-ray. She's got IVC filter. But this is what she looks like. And just a couple things is, you see how her face is up, up, unhappy? She was very unhappy when I first met her. I mean, and, I'm, and I'm totally being serious about this. And the side views, you see how her head's kind of back and her glasses are almost falling off. And the one thing you can't, you you don't realize is that her hips and her knees are always flexed. You see that? Mm -hmm. I, I had her uh, raise her dress. And the reason she does that is she can't look forwards unless she does that because her back is bent forwards. So people flex their hips and knees not, so they can look forwards. Now, if I asked you to do that, you would be exhausted. It's very tiring to walk like that. So this is what people look like. They get... 
they have to walk with a flex position. And this is her x-rays. You can see how she still has spondylolisthesis at two levels, and she's, lost, and she's pitched forward. This is the CAT scan. And this is the MRI. So her problem is that she has flat back. She has hip flexion contractures. Uh, interesting when you lay her flat, she can she can make her knee her hips and knees straight, so it's it's not fixed. It's a flexible deformity. So she does that on purpose. And her lordosis is short. She has a fusion mass. It's kind of complicated. So this is what I thought would be the best wedge uh, osteotomy uh, to fix it. Now, granted, I I tried to uh, I tried to uh, refer her elsewhere, and I asked her where how she got referred to me. And she told me with a straight face she was referred by God. And then I said, well, how, how did God, I don't know what she meant by that, how did God refer me? She goes, well, she goes, I prayed to God, I went to the phone book, and I picked your name. So then my friend, a friend of mine said, it wasn't God, it's just that your name starts with A. That's what she did. <laughs> but, but seriously, and I, and I uh, I, in all seriousness, when she told me that, I kind of, I really took this problem seriously. I really wanted to fix it. I felt maybe... You never know. Maybe it was from God. So I got I to gotta do a good job on this lady. So I took it really seriously. So I thought about doing the wedge osteotomy at four. And, and this is what it would look like. And I was planning this. I was like, that, that doesn't look good. Like it's still got spondylolisthesis. It's still pitched forwards. You see that? And then, and then I, I said, well, what would it look like if I did it on five? It looks a lot better at five, don't you think? See how it's bent backwards? It looks like more like a, lump, a normal lumbar spine. The problem is doing it at five is very difficult because it's deeper. And you don't have many, that many points of fixation after, uh, below. You only have iliacs and sacrum. So, you know, I thought about it, but I figured I, I had to do it right. Again, if, it, if, if this referral is coming from God and I mess this up, I'm, I'm in big trouble. So, so this is my intraoperative notes. I lost 1.7 liters of blood, which is less than what other averages are, but it's not good, but it wasn't terrible. And it took me nine hours. It's technically, it was, yeah, it was a very challenging procedure. And it went very well. And this kind of shows you how I, I linked everything. It wasn't easy getting everything to link up. And this is the post-op x-ray standing. Uh, it, it looks crazy with all the screws. And this is her three months post-op. And this is just a CAT scan. I had a screw in the pelvis. I wanted to make sure it didn't come out. And this is the CAT scan. It, it looks perfect. It's exactly as I planned to do it. And you can see the alignment looks really good. Even though it looks messy and it's weird, the alignment sort of looks like a normal lumbar spine. And this is her post-op. And there's a couple things. First of all, look at that big smile. And then second is look how her glasses are nice on her face now. And her, and her hips and knees are straight. She's really, really happy. And I just saw her last week. And... She wanted like some time all three. She gets to get some back pain, but otherwise she's really happy. And this is her six years out now. So, so it's not, I mean, these people are really, if you can fix them, they're really, really, first of all, very loyal patients. They will find you. If you're in a hole in a cave in Pennsylvania, they will find you because they're so appreciative and they want you to, they want you to take care of them because you, you've done such a big surgery. This is a, this is another case, a 65 year old man, Again, flat back deformity. He had low back pain. He's severe L5 and S1 radiculopathy, basically coming from the base of his spine. He's had three previous surgeries. He had L1, L5 laminectomy, and he had instability, recurring pain. And then I did a revision L1, L5 fusion, and unfortunately that failed three or four years post-op because he started getting L5, S1 problems. And you can see the L5, S1 segments abnormal. See how it's like the disc is gone, and it's... Uh, <coughs> And it was giving him nerve root irritation. So I just did a decompression L5-S1. And I said, you know, anything else is going to be massive. Let's just do a small thing. It didn't work. So he kept having L5-S1 problems. It hurt. He wanted it fixed. It was very painful. And you can see everything's at L5-S1. But the problem is, above L5-S1, he's got a big fusion. And this is what he walks like. And he was, he was very unhappy, very uncomfortable. And the other problem is you can see above at level 12, 11, T10, T11, he had pressure on his spinal cord on top of that. Mm -hmm. See that? Mm -hmm. and, and here you can see the canal is very tight there. So I thought, you know, if we're going to do a surgery, I think I have to include that because I want to make sure that you feel good afterwards. 
So it's a, it's a very difficult problem here. L5, S1, you can see, is a mess. He's got a big fusion mass, L1 to L5, and he's got T10, T11 uh, spinal cord compression. So, you know, it's a difficult case. I mean, basically, I think if you do it, you gotta you got to fix it all. And this, you can see how the... He kept getting the, this massive synovial cyst at L5S1 because that level was very arthritic. So this, what, this is what L5S1 should look like. Half a lordosis should come from the L5S1 disc space. And you, you can see what he looks like. His L5S1 disc space is a mess. See that? He's got, he's, I mean, he's kyphotic there. So it was a very bad problem. Um, so this is just my pre-op planning. And I decided to do a PSO at 4. I thought 4 would be fine. And this is what my PSO looked like. This is the standard way that Bridwell's, Bridwell wrote an article of how to do it. Leave the canal a little bit open so you close it down. And, I, and again, I did, the, I did the osteotomy through the disc space because of what we said. And this is him post-op. And I also, like one month post-op, I went in the front to his belly and, and put a block of bone just to make sure the base fuses. And you can see his alignment's good here. And you can see Aaron Shoma L4 where the PSO was. Yeah, she had that the square is gone now. And this is just up top. You can see I, I put a, I plugged a piece of bone in the front at L5S1 just to guarantee the base fuses. And this is him post-op, and this is how he walks now. Um, and and you can see it's an amazing difference. So when when I first showed you all those complication rates, uh I'm sure everybody here said, why are you guys doing this operation? And the reason is it makes a huge difference in people's lives. But it's a big cost. Now, personally, so far, I've been very lucky in the cases that I've done, although I did have one recently come through the office, and I was really tired that day, and I just sent it to the University of Maryland. and said, you get a second opinion. I'll do it for you, or you can ask one of these guys to do more of them. Um, it's very difficult, challenging surgery. Yeah. So that's it. Pedicle subtraction osteotomy. So any any questions about the cases like pedicle subtraction osteotomy or yeah, our case? You think it's going to uh, heal? You know the the hormone is really powerful. So I, I think it's I think it's going to heal. Although I've I have seen a non-union. It was a very big space. Yeah. Is well, there anything that they, like the patient can do to like improve the chances of the fusion? I mean, non-smoking -sm uh, is a, is a risk factor. Um, I mean, some people say ultrasound helps. I mean, it's not. It, and there's some evidence that external ultrasound. Maybe we should get one for her. Yeah, maybe we should get one for her. Yeah, let's get one for her. Can you remember? <laughs> <laughs> can you get you kids outpatient? It's not it's not under her uh, jurisdiction. Oh, yeah, yes. <laughs> can you get an external blood stimulator for her? I can send you the email. The, the guy who does it. Yeah. I forgot. I know she's right. She is on the list. So those are the two things I can think of. I, yeah. Is, I'm not clear on what you do with it. That posterior area. If you you use the, use the, the uh, instrumentation, I guess. To, what do you mean? You, you remove the. You remove the bone and you bring it backward. You you may cut a wedge, and then at the back yeah. of the wedge, the bones are touching, so they fuse. So you cut a wedge, and then you pull the wedge down, just like a piece of wood, and every all the bones are touching now, and they should fuse. But if it's not, it's hard to do this. I mean, you're you're cutting you're cutting uh, basically you're cutting a human being in half, and and bringing it back together. It's not easy. It's not it's not easy to get it to work. There's a lot of tricks involved. Like like you can't let the wedge close while you're cutting it. For example, you have to keep it open. You put temporary rods. So you got to cut the wedge, and you got to make it just right so it all fits just right. Huh. You have to be a carpenter. And then once you make a good wedge, and you think you're good. Then you let go of the screws, and then you bend the table and see if you can get it to close down. And sometimes it doesn't close down perfectly. And this one closed down 20 degrees in the first case, but not completely. And she got a non-union as a result. So that, that's it's it's a difficult surgery. That's right. And it's usually on older people, and it's usually on sick people. 
because that's who has disease. You know, as you get older, young kids usually don't have. It's usually older sick women. That's where doctors we take care of sick people. Yeah, you can get the back diffuse. Yeah, you can get the back diffuse. Yeah. In the front, right? If you do it right, it should still fuse. Um, but I think it's just easier to take the disc out. It's not. It's not any harder. Like technically, it's the same operation. It's just you do it in a little bit of a different place. So I think you should do it there every time. I mean, I don't know. I'm not an expert at these things. I mean, there's some people that have done like a hundred of these things. Um, I, I, you know, I don't know what their opinion is. At least four. I mean, at least four screws minimum. I think you need a minimum four screws above and below. Through the instrumentation, but that doesn't work as well. The table's better. Most people have a. Most people have a. a well, actually, that's not true. I, I don't know. There's you need it. You need the right table. You can you can use an old table and do it with that with the old. Uh, you can use the old operating room table, the flat table we usually use, and bend the table and do the whole thing through an old table. Because that's what we used to do at Shock Trauma. We used to use just the old tables and pillows and stuff, and then and then bend the old table and put like pillows between the legs. We'd have the nurses get underneath the sheets and do it in the old days. So you can still you can still do it. Yeah. What else? Any other questions? Kristen, any questions? <laughs> yeah, yeah, it's complicated. Yeah, and you have to write the, these cases. You have to write down your plan because you can imagine. Yeah, I don't think too it's right hard. Like how much planning? Not every, like, not every case, but these complicated right, yeah. cases, you got to think. You got to about think about everything because there's a lot of ways. You should plan it just like you get a piece of paper. You you, you feel like you're in second grade, mm -hmm. but. <laughs> That's the best way to do it. You get a piece of paper and you think about it conceptually. Well, that's right, because I know with the joints, they're doing, like, they do a CAT scan. And then yeah, do the CAT scan, yeah. They do that in their there, there, are, there are things like that. But, you know, the, the, the incremental help that all these computer programs is minor compared to, like, to, to doing it with paper in the old school way. I mean, yeah. the, the strength of, the strength of, uh, the strength of uh, in medicine is comes from our human creativity and our mind. You know, mm -hmm. humans, they are, and that and that people like forget that. And it's, mm -hmm. it's just really basic concepts. If you don't have the, I mean, if you don't have the fundamental basic concepts, you'll fail, no matter what computers you have or programs or instruments. I mean, what do you think, Doctor David? I mean, the simple concepts are usually in medicine are the most important ones. I don't know. Yeah. When you're prime, when you take care of patients, you have to think about and and because because if it doesn't work, you're on the hook. I mean, you you failed. It wasn't the program or the instrumentation or whatever, and so you really failed as a physician. So. All right. Any other any other questions? All right. Thanks for coming.